Okay, we will officially now get started. Welcome everybody. We are so excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I get to welcome you all here today for a very fantastic Friday class. Professor George is with us today. Professor George is gonna to talk to us all about civil liberties. And he is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and the Director of the James Madison Program at Princeton University. He's gonna help us unpack the meaning of civil liberties over time and really understand its origins as well as its current conversations around the topic. But to do all this great work, we're gonna be led by our president and CEO, Jeff Rosen. So please ask questions in the chat, ask them in the q and I'll make sure that they get to Jeff. And without further ado, Jeff, I'm turning it over to you for this happy Friday. Thank you so much, Curry, and welcome, Professor George. It is always so meaningful to welcome you to our Friday class and to have the um, privilege of your insights. There's so much for us to talk about, and there's so many, many ways we could address this important question of civil liberties on this Easter and Passover Friday. But I thought I would start with your indulgence, if you, if you, if you think it's an illuminating place to start, with Jefferson's Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom in 1779, which talks about freedom of conscience as a natural right. And I'm gonna read the first sentence in Jefferson's draft and then ask you about the history of the effort to achieve freedom of conscience in Virginia, why the founders thought it was a natural right and why it might even be viewed as the first of all natural rights, the reason that the rest of the constitution exists to protect. So Jefferson began by saying, well aware that the opinions and belief of men depend not on their own will, but follow involuntarily the evidence proposed to their minds that almighty God hath created the mind free and manifested his supreme will that free it shall remain by making it altogether insusceptible of restraint. Is, is that a good place to begin? And what was Jefferson talking about when he talked about the mind being made free and altogether insusceptible of restraint? Uh, well, it's a very good place to begin, uh, Jeff. But first, let me thank you uh, and thank our friend Carrie Sotner uh, for inviting me once again to be part of the work of the National Constitution Center. I'm delighted to be part of it because the National Constitution Center does such a wonderful job on such an urgent topic, and that is educating Americans, young Americans, all Americans, about our basic constitutional principles, including those fundamental principles of civil liberty, which all of us uh, cherish. So uh, Jeffrey has uh, asked me to begin with some reflections on religious freedom. Jefferson's argument for religious freedom, uh, styled as freedom of conscience, a bit broader than our usual way of speaking of it as, as religious freedom. The First Amendment to the Constitution talks about the free exercise of religion. Uh, the original proposal for that amendment had been to use the term conscience, but the, 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 the framers and ratifiers decided not to go that route, but rather to refer to religion. But uh, they do, I think, and this is controversial, but for, from my point of view, they do pretty much come down to the same thing. It's our thoughts, our reflections on what is ultimate, what is most important, the ultimate sources of meaning and value in our lives and in the universe. And what Jefferson is doing in the passage that, uh, that Jeff Rosen quoted is he's making a theological argument. Notice that. It's a theological argument. His appeal is to God. It's God who we're answerable to for respecting the freedom of conscience, including freedom of religion, of all our citizens. Now, why is that? It's because faith cannot be compelled. Genuine faith, if it's faith, must be a free act of intellect and will. After all, the government or a, a, a mob or a tyrant can compel you or me to perform the outward signs of religious faith, attending a religious ceremony, uh, saying a prayer. They can compel the outward signs, but they can't compel the inward acts of intellect and will that are the very substance of faith. So what Jefferson is saying here is that 
the mind is free. You can, you can force us to say things, you can force us to do things, but you can't reach the interior life that is of the essence of conscience and uh, religion. And we ourselves, notice Jefferson is saying, do not choose our beliefs. We often talk as if we do, but we don't choose our beliefs. We are led to our beliefs by our reasoning, by our reflection, by our thought, by our prayer. It's not that we get to pick and choose the way we would choose from a restaurant menu. Oh, I'll have the steak tonight, or no, I'll have the chicken tonight. We are forced by the strength of our conviction to hold or not hold this or that. So we disrespect not only ourselves, we disrespect God when we purport to compel acts that are by their nature and cannot but be free, the acts of intellect and will that are the substance of faith that are in the end what conscience is all about. So powerfully put um, and so beautifully distilled for our friends and explains to us why freedom of conscience is an unalienable right. And of course, Madison echoed Jefferson's reasoning in his memorial and remonstrance in 1785, where he said, as you just did too, Professor George, it is the right of every man to exercise religion according to the dictates of reason and conviction, not force or violence. This right is in its nature unalienable because the opinions of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of other men. So that's such a powerful explanation of what an unalienable right it is. As, as you said, I can't alienate to you the power to control my thoughts because they're not entirely within my own control, with the power of my reason and reflection, and why conscience is an unalienable right. This is precisely... Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I thought you had finished. I was going to say this is precisely right. Now, notice, though, some nuances here that are important. Yeah. This is not to deny a legitimate place for religious authority in the life of the believer. Sometimes people make the mistake of reading Jefferson or Madison in that way, but it is a, is, it is a mistake. But when we recognize religious authority, we do that on the basis of the strength of our conviction. The reasons we believe we have for recognizing, say, this rabbi as having authoritative teaching or the Pope as having authoritative teaching or the authority of scripture, the Bible or the Quran or whatever we believe God has revealed himself uh, in. We are not there alienating our uh, conscience, alienating our freedom. We're exercising our freedom to act on our best judgments as to where we should recognize authority. But if I just say on the basis of no conviction at all, but just let's say out of uh, apathy, well, Jeff, you know, religion is, uh, you know, it's a trivial matter. Manner. I'm not going to worry too much about it. You just tell me what to believe and I'll believe it. Now, I have no reason for recognizing your authority, just as you would have no reason for recognizing my authority. That is not being a person who respects one's own liberty of conscience. That is attempting to alienate what is unalienable. Very, very helpful distinction or reminder of the place for religious authority, but only when we embrace the authority based on our own reason. And uh, it is a, central to uh, the founder's vision. I, I, t t tell, tell us about the historical context here. This is a time in Virginia where Baptists can be in prison for three years for preaching their faith, where you can be fined or jailed for not attending the established church. And Jefferson and Madison are trying to disestablish the church at the same time that Patrick Henry is trying to support a general uh, tax to support Christianity in general, which, which Madison and Jefferson are resisting. So what, what, what's going on and what ended up happening once the bill was passed? Well, as you'll uh, already see from what Jeff Rosen has said, there was a spectrum of views here. It wasn't just that there were two views of uh, the people who wanted to punish you for attending a Baptist uh, service and those who wanted the complete disestablishment of uh, religion in, in Virginia. There was a spectrum. Uh, some people thought, well, we should continue to have an established church, but we should tolerate, accept other churches and not punish dissenters from the established church who chose to attend 
the other churches or who perhaps uh, wanted to attend no, uh, no church at all. Uh, there were uh, some people who wanted an established church in a certain sense, but not any specific denomination. They wanted just support for Christianity in general, and the establishment would consist in financial support by government uh, of Christianity uh, in general. Uh, you can imagine someone today having a similar view, but even more expansive, saying, well, we should support religion in general, but no uh, particular religion. So there was a spectrum of uh, positions. In the original colonies, probably a majority, depending on exactly how you define an establishment of religion, probably a majority had established churches. Um, but uh, by the 1830s, when we were already now the United States, of course, we we're an independent nation. But, but by the 1830s, the last of those establishments died out. But that means for the early part of our national history, even after we had become an independent nation, no longer under England, which had its own established church, uh, we had established churches uh, in the United States. They were not disestablished by the First Amendment. The First Amendment forbade Congress from establishing a church. But it also, at the same time, forbade Congress from interfering with or disestablishing or, or taxing or harassing in any way uh, the state established uh, churches. So Americans were wrestling with the question of an establishment of religion and the relationship of freedom of religion to an established religion for quite, uh, for quite a long time. We mustn't think that uh, having religious freedom is incompatible with having an established church. I myself am not in favor of having an established church, but I'm someone who lived for five years of my life uh, under an established church. I lived in England, where they still have the Church of England, and I happen not to be a member of that church. I happen to be a Catholic, uh, a, a member of a religion that was historically uh, discriminated against uh, in England after the English Reformation. But nevertheless, I lived in perfect freedom, perfect freedom of religion, despite having an established uh, church there. Now, of course, not all established churches uh, in nations that have religious establishments are as benign toward uh, dissenters as the Church of England in England uh, uh, was and, and, and is. But they're really two separate questions. They're not unrelated, but they're two separate questions. Should there be an establishment of religion? Should there be religious freedom? There were many Americans early in the light in the uh, in the period of our national history, in the early period of our national history, there were plenty of Americans who wanted an established church or something like an established church, but also wanted religious freedom. Then there were people like Madison and Jefferson who said, no, we need religious freedom and really to have the robust religious freedom, we need to have the full protection. We can't have an established church. Uh, fascinating and very helpful to get that range of views. Um, now I want to ask you uh, about a, a thesis that uh, I have. Um, you know, we're unveiling this beautiful First Amendment wall that I have in my yeah. backdrop uh, in a few weeks. And I want to argue that the four main arguments for protecting free speech throughout American history can be traced to this important bill by Jefferson for establishing religious freedom. We've already talked about the first one, that freedom of conscience is an unalienable right, because people can only think for themselves. The other ones that Jefferson makes are that free speech makes representatives accountable to we the people, uh, that free speech is necessary for the discovery of truth and the rejection of falsehood, and free speech allows the public discussion necessary for democratic self-government. We, we could run through the bill and sort of parse it, but as a, as a general matter, how does that sound to you as, a, as, a, as an argument? Uh, that sounds right, and uh, notice that none of those four is one that is often supposed to be the real historical reason for free speech, and that is a modus vivendi among people who sharply disagree with each other, but essentially make a social contract. I won't interfere with your speaking in return for you're not interfering with my speaking. But that one didn't figure in any of your four, and I think it's right to, I think uh, people very often exaggerate the modus vivendi argument as far as its role in history was concerned. I think that the uh, points that you have made uh, actually are the ones that have mattered historically the most. Wonderful. I'm so glad to get your tentative uh, approval and I'll, 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 I'll send you a draft <laughs> to make sure it's right. But what really struck me, uh, Professor George, is that all of those four reasons appear in Justice Brandeis's concurring opinion in the Whitney versus California opinion. 
and Brandeis read Jefferson over the summer of 1926. He, I did not know about that last point. Amazing. Yeah, he, and, and he tracks them in order. I haven't, he doesn't attribute all of them, but um, it's, it's an exact recapitulation in, in more distilled language of Jefferson's four arguments. And of course, Jefferson's doing it in the context of religious freedom and freedom of conscience and Brandeis of a free speech, but it's just a remarkable synchronicity. That is fascinating. And notice that that third argument of Jefferson's anticipates the argument being much more fully worked out by John Stuart Mill, the great English uh, uh, philosopher, one of the founding fathers of uh, what we've come to call liberalism uh, in, the, in the 19th century. So Mill, in his famous essay on liberty, puts the accent, he puts the emphasis on the role of freedom of speech in the enterprise of truth seeking, that uh, we all know we're fallible. We all know we make errors, all too easily make errors. We can't be too confident about any of our beliefs. We can hold them with conviction, but we always have to be open to the possibility, because we know our own fallibility, that we might be wrong. And therefore, we need to not only respect other people's rights to speak, we need to be willing to listen to their challenges to our views, no matter how deeply held our views are, or cherished our views are, or how identity forming they are for us, we still need to be open in order to be able to tell in the end whether we're in error or we're in fact right. And if, and if we're in error, then we need to be grateful to a person who points out our errors. Or even if we're partially right, but partially in error, we should be grateful to the person who corrects the part that's in error. And Mill goes on to say, even if we're totally right and the person challenging us is totally wrong, by listening to an intelligent person challenge us and having to think through that challenge, we will deepen our understanding of the truth that we already hold. So if we're genuine truth seekers, which we should be, Mill says, then we are going to respect other people's freedom of speech and we're gonna do more than merely respect it, we're gonna listen. So powerful to have Mill's development and reinforcement of Jefferson's idea that in a contest with error, truth will rule as long as reason is there to adjudicate. Now, to, um, to, to Mill, of course, warned about the danger not only of government suppression of speech, but also the overwhelming pressures of social conformity that might chill people from listening to competing arguments. And freedom of conscience must exist, or let me ask you it as a question because I'm not sure, doesn't freedom of conscience exist against attempts to suppress it by social conformity and private individuals as well as government. And, I, and then I want to ask this big question of what are we to make of Mill and Jefferson's concern about social conformity, chilling speech in the context of truth and error in an age when so much of the threats to free speech come not only from government, but also from Twitter, from the internet and from, from mob pressures online. I want to say amen. Uh, Mill himself was concerned about um, legal coercion and other forms of coercion. But I think it's probably fair to say, Jeff, that he was even a bit more concerned about the tyranny of public opinion or the, um, the tendency of, of people to conform their opinions to whatever the orthodoxy was, especially if people feel subtle or not so subtle pressures to conform if one's future educational opportunities may be at risk, if one does not conform one's way of speaking uh, to the dominant opinion, if one's professional opportunities in the future will be at risk, uh, if one is uh, at risk of losing treasured friendships as a result of, of questioning uh, a dominant uh, uh, opinion within a group or within the larger society. Remember, Mill's fundamentally concerned here with truth seeking. He's Socratic in this way. He's fundamentally concerned with truth seeking and he's worried about whatever will impede our free inquiry into truth recognizing that we ourselves may be wrong and whatever the dominant opinion is in our community might turn out to be wrong all of us know from historical experience our own experience of error having been wrong and then finally figuring out that we're wrong and we all know from the historical experience of mankind how often People have tragically held views in good faith, believing them to be true, thinking they were in the right, thinking what they believed was good. And it turns out that, of course, they were completely in the wrong. And because Mill's so concerned about truth seeking, 
he wants to make sure that people don't become conformist, that that tyranny, that power of public opinion doesn't shape their views in ways that would preclude their eliminating error and getting closer and closer and closer to the fullness of truth. Wow, so let me now ask you, and some friends in the chat are asking too, oh, what do we do about the age of Twitter? One of our uh, colleagues says, Twitter is much in the news. We hear it's a private company, not subject to free speech strictures. Um, but um, what do we do in an age when on Twitter, people feel great pressure to conform to the views of um, mobs and galvanized groups on the left and right? And as a result, there may be tremendous pressures for social conformity that are the uh, challenge to truth. Uh, well, I, I myself am active on Twitter, but I've had no interaction at all with uh, Twitter officials. But when Facebook was uh, putting together its Facebook Supreme Court, uh, its board, uh, now co-chaired by our friend Michael McConnell, uh, to um, deal with questions of free speech on Facebook, uh, they were in touch with me, and I strongly advised them, I pleaded with them, to err on the side of freedom, err on the side of freedom of speech, uh, have as robust a freedom of speech as you possibly can have on the platform, to the extent you possibly can, try to track our constitutional norms of free speech, have faith that the best bet is on free speech. When it comes to getting at the truth, if people say things that are wrong, if people try to spread disinformation and misinformation, allow freedom to people who can correct those errors answer bad speech with better speech answer bad speech with with more speech neither mill nor i will say you're going to get a guarantee truth's going to win out every time but which way do you want to bet do you want to bet on censorship as the as the better path to preserving truth or do you want to bet on free speech i will bet on free speech jeff every time. And this is what I strongly advise Facebook to do. And if Twitter asked me, I would tell them to do the same thing. Now, um, these platforms, I think, have, um, have not taken that advice. Uh, they are engaging in, from my point of view, too much censorship and contributing to the very sort of climate that, that Mill was concerned about, that, that climate of opinion that, that suffocates freedom, that pressures people to conform to prevailing use. Uh, we have a name for it that Mill and Jefferson didn't have, political correctness or sometimes woke ideology. But it can happen on the other side as well. We think of the woke as on the left, but it can also happen on the right within sub-communities on the right. You know, if you don't conform to whatever the, the, the position is, the pro-Trump position or whatever it is, you then are an outcast. You're thrown out of the group. You're, you may lose professional opportunities or future educational opportunities or, or what have you. Wherever it happens, it's bad. Whatever happens, it's bad. We really should make our bet on freedom. I think that's not only the best way to maximize our chances of getting more and more fully in touch with the truth. Also, if we can go to your arguments number two and four from Jefferson, it's also the best way to ensure that the mechanisms of democracy are well lubricated and moving us forward. Uh, I'll introduce Jeffrey, someone, of course, uh, whose, whose work you know well, the late Alexander Micklejohn, great theorist of the First Amendment from the early part of the 20th century, late part of the 19th century, uh, who did wonderful work examining the importance of freedom of speech, of open communication to the functioning of democracy. In a democracy, what our founders would have preferred the term republic to name, so let's call it a democratic republic. We'll split the difference. In a democratic republic, the whole theory is the people rule. We rule ourselves. No king rules us. No benign despot rules us. No council of the elect uh, uh, rule us. We rule ourselves. Now, we rule ourselves through elected representatives, but we rule ourselves. To rule ourselves well, we need to be able to communicate with each other openly, challenge each other openly criticize each other openly and criticize whoever is temporarily, democracy, it's always temporary, temporarily in charge of the government. So that if they're making mistakes, those mistakes can be corrected. Or if there's a better way 
that better way can be identified. You really, at the end of the day, it seems to me, Michael John's right about this, you really can't have a functioning democracy serving the common good of the people if you suppress freedom of speech. They are like uh, love and marriage or the horse and carriage. They go together. <laughs> if we try to have an illiberal democracy, in the end, we won't have a democracy. A liberal democracy is a democracy that respects civil liberty, starting with our freedom of religion and our freedom of speech. Well, I'll say amen to that. Professor George, that was magnificent. I'm so heartened that you have challenged us to have faith that our best bet is on free speech. And I can't say it better than you just did, but at a time when many are questioning whether that faith is well-placed uh, and are concerned about the spread of disinformation and don't trust the, the fact that truth will ultimately win out, you are saying we must bet on free speech. And I agree with you. I want um, you to take another beat making that case to, to friends who may be skeptical of it because it's it's very much under attack. I want to ask you uh, about, I want to begin by asking you about Mikkel John. I remember just a bit from law school, he said something like everything worth saying should be said rather than that, you know, that, that everyone should speak. So, and then he had some notion perhaps of a moderator or a, a kind of uh, public square where, where speech was moderated. Tell me if I have that right. And then, but more more importantly about uh, Mickle John, what is your answer to, to those who, in response to the wonderful statement you just gave, will say, well, you know, in an age when conspiracy theories rule and disinformation reigns, we just can't trust the people to ultimately choose the truth and therefore need more moderation and not less. Well, it is a question of trust. I agree with that. Uh, and we're going to have to do some trusting one way or another. There's no sure bet here. That means we are betting, we are gambling. It's gonna take trust. Uh, now, people who don't wanna do it my way, who don't wanna trust free speech, are going to have to tell me who that reliably virtuous person is that they want to trust to restrict the freedom of speech of other people. Is it President Biden? Is it a future President DeSantis? Is it the New York Times? Is it the Wall Street Journal? Is it the folks over at The Nation magazine? Is it the folks over at National Review? Uh, we might find a truly neutral party, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe Jeffrey Rosen at the National <laughs> Convention Never. Center, but he's such a believer in free speech, he wouldn't take the job. Absolutely. There's no one, Jeff, we can trust with that power. Go back to Federalist number 10, Madison. You know, uh, if, uh, if, if men were angels, you wouldn't need laws. Now, he, he's exaggerating there, yet, there because if men were angels, you'd still need laws to provide some coordination norms and things like that. But you wouldn't have to worry about bad guys if men were angels. Uh, but men aren't angels. No man is. Uh, all of us are frail, fallen, fallible uh, creatures uh, given to the kinds of vices that, that Madison lays out there in, in, in Federalist 10. And even the virtuous among us are constantly struggling. It's a lifetime struggle to live a life of virtue. And then we've got that old line from Lord Acton's, old but true, power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. Henry VIII didn't begin as a homicidal maniac. Henry VIII was a young man of learning, faith, uh, someone who seemed to be, and, and undoubtedly was, a good man, but he was corrupted by power. That's why we don't want to give people the kind of power we would be handing someone if we gave them power over our freedom of speech. Now, does that mean all speech is equal? No. Does that mean we should listen to everybody, no matter how insane and stupid, and malicious? No. Does that mean there are no limits on free speech? No, we do limit free speech. Our First Amendment allows free speech to be limited in the case of obscenity, defamation, intimidation, threats, uh, incitement to uh, violence, false advertising, and so forth. But those are a very limited set of definable exceptions. 
the general rule has to be free speech, even though it can be abused. Here, Jeff, I think is where the heart of free speech is. And here I'm, I'm speaking in my own voice for myself, but I, I'm, I'm gonna conjure up here the spirit of my ancestors, of, of John Stuart Mill and Thomas Jefferson and Socrates. I think we need to be prepared to listen and engage and never shut down anybody who is prepared to do business in the proper currency of intellectual discourse, which is also the proper currency of democratic discourse. What is that currency? Well, just as nations have economic currencies in England, it's pounds and pence in the United States, and it's dollars and cents. In the intellectual life and in the democratic life, there is a currency, a currency of discourse. And that currency consists of reasons, arguments, and evidence. Reasons, arguments, and evidence. And that's why we need role models across the political spectrum, people on the left to people on the right, people in the center, doesn't matter what their ideological stance is, who conduct business, who set the example by conducting business in the currency of democratic intellectual discourse, reasons, arguments, evidence, not name calling, not slandering, uh, not shouting, not demagoguery. We're right to criticize the demagogues on the left or the right, but we need role models from left to right who are doing business in the currency of proper democratic and intellectual discourse. This is why I love working with my friend Cornell West. Cornell's on the left side of the spectrum. I'm on the conservative side. What do we have in common? We both try to do business, both in politics and in the intellectual life, in the proper currency of democratic discourse, giving reasons, making arguments, providing evidence, being willing to challenge each other, challenge ourselves, criticize each other, be self-critical. That's the spirit of democracy. And that's the spirit we need to model for our young people and for all of our citizens. But we need role models. This is why religions, Jeff, so often have saints. We use those saints as role models. We need role models. We need role models exemplifying what democratic discourse at its best is like. And our First Amendment allows for that. So let's take advantage of it. We've got the protection of the First Amendment. Let's do it. Amen once more. And, and, and you are a role model and your discussions with Cornell West are role models. These classes are role models. That's the whole purpose of the National Constitution Center is to bring together people of different perspectives to role model civil discourse based on reason, argument, and evidence. And, and we're, you're giving our friends who are listening role models to learn from. Socrates, Mill, we've talked about Jefferson, Brandeis, who's another hero of mine, and all of these great, great uh, men and women throughout history provide evidence for what rule by reason can be. Let me ask you this. So much of what we've talked about, beginning with freedom of conscience to the very nature of democratic discourse is based on faith in reason and enlightenment faith in the project of argument by reason. Is there a danger that that faith itself is under assault today? And what can we do to hold the beacon of reason high so that people will continue to embrace it? Uh, yes, um, it's under assault. There's no question that faith in reason and the power of reason, the truth attaining power of reason is under assault. Lots of people don't believe that truth exists or if it exists, that it is knowable. And the trouble is when people cease believing in truth, or cease believing that truth can be attained with effort, carefully, with argument, always subject to fallible uh, mistake, to our fallibility, to our mistakes. But when people stop believing, Jeff, in truth, they stop believing in the power of reason to attain truth. It all comes down to power. We're now not arguing about what is true, what is best, what is right, what is just. We're just arguing to try to get power for ourselves, for our tribe, for our clan, for our group, for our party, for our ideology. And that ends up in a catastrophe every single time, whether it's on the right or the left, it doesn't matter who wins. That is the high road uh, to, to tyranny. So we need to restore faith and reason. And I think the way to do that is by role models. 
and by the kind of work you're doing at the National Constitution Center, the kind of work we're trying to do here at Princeton in the James Madison program in American Ideals and Institutions, the kind of work that parents do with their children, the kind of work that good teachers in K-12 are doing with their young, uh, young charges. Uh, just a little point about the Enlightenment. I don't want to give the Enlightenment too much credit here. Now, the Enlightenment deserves some credit, but the Enlightenment is a very complicated business, uh, had its pros and cons. And in fact, there wasn't really, strictly speaking, one Enlightenment. There were several very different Enlightenments. The French Enlightenment, very different from the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, I'd actually take the Scottish Enlightenment because I'm a believer in the kinds of things that we've been uh, talking about. And I think that the Scottish Enlightenment exemplified those virtues, including faith and reason, much better than the French Enlightenment on the whole did. The other thing we need to do is not imagine, rewrite history so that we imagine that there was no belief in freedom, uh, no belief in uh, the power of reason prior to the Enlightenment, that it was all dark ages. It wasn't. Socrates was pre-Enlightenment. Aquinas, Maimonides, Al-Farabi, the great medieval thinkers obviously were pre-enlightenment. Uh, um, so the historical picture is, is complicated and we could, we could argue about where there should be credit and where there should be blame, but our goal should be to restore faith in truth while at the same time reminding everybody that we never attain it perfectly, and all of us are fallible. I, I often remind, you've probably heard me do this, Jeff, I often remind audiences when I'm speaking that uh, if I ask the question, who in this room, right now, sitting here, has no false beliefs in their head, not a single hand would go up. All of us know, every single one of us across the entire globe, that some of what we believe right now in our heads is wrong. Now you might say, okay, well then if you know you have some false beliefs, why do you hold them? Why don't you swap them out for true beliefs? And the obvious answer is because I don't know which ones are wrong and which ones are right. But if you shut down anybody who challenges your beliefs, you will never be able to swap out the false ones for true ones. You will only allow to be heard voices that reinforce what you already believe. They will reinforce what you believe that happens to be true, but they will equally reinforce what you believe that happens to be false. So if we really are truth seekers, if we believe in truth, if we want the truth, if we haven't fallen so deeply in love with our own opinions or our own ideology that we favor it over truth, then we will want to be advocates of free speech. We will want to hear criticism. We will want to be challenged so we can swap out those false beliefs we know are in there somewhere for true ones. Bravo. You can never swap out false beliefs for true ones if we shut down anyone who challenges our beliefs. And that so beautifully crystallizes our broad topic today, which was the history of civil liberties in America, beginning with the history of freedom of conscience, we've broadened out our discussion to realize the centrality of dissent as the essence of truth seeking. I always turn back the mic to Curry reluctantly, never more so than when I'm talking to you, Professor George, but I want to ask you for just some concluding thoughts uh, that wrap up our discussion of the history of freedom of conscience with the uh, history of civil liberties in America more generally and their importance for truth seeking. Well, uh, our founding uh, fathers, when they proposed uh, our Constitution, uh, noted that government has basically two tasks. Uh, Madison uh, says in Federalist Number 51, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Lots of governments are good at controlling the governed, not so good at controlling themselves. That's how tyranny happens. And our founding fathers did not want to jump from the tyranny they experienced under British rule to a homegrown version of that tyranny. So they put the focus on how can we construct a constitution that will require government to control itself. That's gonna be the hardest job. And that's fundamentally what civil liberties 
comes down to. Civil liberties are the government trying to control itself, respecting the liberty of the people where the government should not intrude into their judgments of faith into their statement of their political opinions or their social opinions or their moral uh, opinions. Government restraining itself, holding back. And of course, our founding fathers thought that the best way for government to control itself, that is the best way to honor and respect and protect political uh, civil liberties, was not to have a Bill of Rights. We eventually got one, but that was not how they originally sought to protect civil liberties. Rather, the theory was we will protect civil liberties by creating a central government that is a government of delegated and enumerated powers with checks and balances such that nobody is exercising unchecked power. And it was with that theory of government for protecting civil liberties in mind that Hamilton, in explaining why he opposed a Bill of Rights, said in Federalist number 84, the Constitution is itself in every rational sense and to every useful purpose a Bill of Rights. Now, of course, he didn't persuade everybody. And as a result, we got our Bill of Rights as a set of amendments. But those amendments are not supposed to undo the original protection of civil liberties that we have in virtue of limiting power in the unamended Constitution. The Bill of Rights was meant to be the, the, the belt that we add to the suspenders. It was to reinforce the protections of civil liberties that were already there. So it's important for us to understand that our civil liberties are not restricted to those mentioned in the Bill of Rights. They extend more broadly wherever government power is restricted by the Constitution, and that's in for example, Article 1, where we have a specification of the powers of the central government. And the central government is not supposed to exercise any powers outside of those specified, those delegated to the government by the people through the instrument of the Constitution. So powerful, such an important reminder that, as you said, it was not the Bill of Rights that was centrally responsible for protecting civil liberties, but checks and balances, separation of powers, the limitations of the Constitution itself. Thank you for all of that wonderful light and learning. And Curry, I will turn it back to you for a few final questions from my friends. I have to be honest, I didn't think it was ever going to come back to me today. And I was okay <laughs> with that. I think I have eight pages of notes because you, this was so unbelievably help, helpful. This is the gateway to civil liberties. So I think it's so important that we spent this much time really unpacking the First Amendment. And thank you for going from pre-enlightenment all the way to modern cases. I'm going to follow up with three, if I can sneak in three questions from the students. Sarah Lynn and both Vicky kind of asked this question. If you said earlier, you know, we want these companies to follow constitutional norms around speech. And I love that because we talk about norms all the time and how do you set norms that engage healthy dialogue in your community of people you're discussing things with. But then there's technology, the 24 hour news cycle that creates you being channeled into just reinforcing your own beliefs, even though they may be wrong. How do we, what kind of norms and behavior should we the people do to ensure that we're finding different sources and challenging ourselves to really look differently at an idea, at a controversy, at an issue. Any suggestions? I sure do. I'm going to make uh, the suggestion to Vicki and the other students who've raised this question, the suggestion I make to my own students and to my own uh, children and to my friends and to myself. You need to be friends with people who disagree with you. And not just those who disagree with you about minor superficial matters those who have fundamental deep disagreements with you. The success of democracy depends on people being able to engage in what I call civic friendship. That is, people being able to be friends with people that they deeply disagree with, people of very different religions, different moral perspectives, different political views. So Vicki and other students, if you don't right now have a friend, a good friend, 
with whom you have profound moral and political disagreements, please go out and make one, find one. We all need to recognize this is not all angels and devil stuff, black hats and white hats. There are reasonable people of goodwill across the political spectrum. This is why I love my friend Cornell West, my dear brother Cornell West, with whom I work so closely despite our disagreements, and I love him so much. You will find reasonable people of goodwill no matter where you stand on the other side. Of course, I don't know Vicky, so I don't know whether Vicky's on the left, on the right, on the middle, wherever you are, Vicky, go find a friend with very different views who will challenge you and is willing to be challenged by you. Make that friend. That's how we should begin. Now we do need to we do need to send a message to these big platforms, to Facebook and Instagram and uh, and Twitter and and so forth. But let's not wait for the long process of reforming those those platforms. Let's begin in our own lives as citizens, as human beings, making friends with people we disagree with, and not simply writing them off as monsters, as bigots, as bad people, haters, or 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 whatever. So. That's my advice there. Now, when we uh, when we sit down to think about uh, Twitter and Facebook, we want to put some pressure on those big platforms, and we want to call them out uh, for their censorship, where that censorship is really beyond the line. Fantastic, and I love when it brings it back to you know sometimes the power that you have is local and it's your neighbor, and you can make huge difference in just talking to people that aren't likely like you in your neighborhood and in your community in your classroom as well. So thank you so much. Okay, two more questions. I'm trying to speak in as much as we can. Um, I love this question that came in first. Actually, it was one of the first ones. Um, have you ever experienced a violation of your own civil rights or civil liberties? And looking back, do you think that you have that um, think that you did, but did not recognize it, and that it was being the case that at that moment in time you couldn't see it? What should we be on the watch for in our own lives? So trying to understand and recognize where there's civil liberties or civil rights violations and that when we should ensure that we're paying attention and have courage to speak up against it. Uh, yeah, um, I can't, at least off the top of my head, think of a personal experience I had. I, I might be missing something obvious that I'm just not remembering. Um, but let me give this advice to the questioner. Um, at least in my own experience, um, when violations of civil liberties happen to people on one's own side of the ideological or partisan divide, uh, you notice them and you want to cry out. You want to say, stop, that's bad, that's terrible. You know, this is a violation of rights. Here's what we need to train ourselves to do. We need to train ourselves to be equally attentive and willing to speak out when we see the violation of civil liberties occurring against somebody we disagree with. Here's the trouble, double standards, you find it on the right and the left. If the civil liberties of someone on the conservative side are violated, the conservatives will squ squeak and squall, but the, uh, the, uh, the liberals won't. Uh, if it's on the liberal side of the divide, the liberals will squeak and squall, and the people on the uh, conservative side won't. Well, we need the conservatives speaking out on behalf of the civil rights and civil liberties of the liberals or progressives. And we need the liberals or progressives speaking out on behalf of the rights of the conservatives. That's the way we can make uh, progress uh, in this country. Again, we need to get beyond this idea that there are black hats and white hats. They're just angels and, and devils. We, uh, uh, the Schmidtian idea, I'm here, uh, Jeffrey will recognize who I'm referring to here, Carl Schmidt. I think we need to get beyond the Schmidtian idea that what politics comes down to in the end is helping your friends and hurting your enemies. That it's all friends and enemies stuff. No, in a democratic republic, we are all civic friends. No matter what we disagree with or how badly we disagree with somebody, when that person's rights are being violated, we need to be in the forefront of calling out that violation and standing up for that person's rights. You, you may, if you follow my Twitter feed, you may see me, and again, I'm a conservative, you may see how often I have spoken out in defense of the rights of people on the progressive side who, whose rights to free speech have been violated in universities, for example. Uh, the examples are things like professors who've said things I really sharply disagree with uh, condemning the police and pressure has been brought on usually state universities to discipline that professor who said these nasty things about the police. Well, I'm out there saying, no, 
I disagree with what this person says about the police. I'm really willing to have an argument, eager to have an argument with that person. But if you are disciplining or punishing or firing that person, then I'm going to oppose that because that person's right to free speech needs to be uh, protected. I, I, I've defended the right of my colleague, Peter Singer, who has very different views from my own on sanctity of life issues, who's defended the morality of infanticide. Believe me, I completely disagree with that. But when disability rights activists and others who substantively I agree with have called for him to be fired from Princeton to lose his job because they disagree with his statements as I do, now I'm defending Peter Singer's rights because he does have the right to free speech, to freedom of thought, to think for himself. Whether he agrees with me or not doesn't matter when it comes to my obligation as I see it to defend his civil liberties, his right to free speech, his academic freedom. That's the attitude I think we need to all adopt. And that was perfect. And you answered the final question, which was Barry's question is, what is the logical path from free speech to truth? And it's defending people that you may not align with. We, we talk, sometimes talk in this class about the other, that it, you, there is no other. We're all a part of the same system. So thank you unbelievably so much. I have so many notes. And as our team of students like to always do, we think about the great t-shirts that we're going to make after our speaker gives us these one-liners we need to hold on to. But I really think the front of my t-shirt is going to say Democratic Republic and the back say we are all civic friends, you know, with a big like wave or something like that, like get into it. I think it's so important when we talk about the belief in the Constitution and our work in democracy that it begins with us and that the charge is with us to make friends, civic friends, to talk to people that we don't agree with and to also defend others, even though we may not be aligned with their beliefs, because it goes back to our system of free speech and civil liberty. So thank you so much for this. It was a fantastic Friday class. We promised it. We knew you'd deliver. And thank you again for doing it one more time for us. Oh, thank you, Carrie. And thanks to Jeff Rosa. And it's just such a thrill always to be part of the important work, the wonderful work of the National Constitution Center. I want to say to everybody out there uh, who's celebrating these holidays, uh, blessed Easter and Passover to you. I hope to see you again soon. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you so, so much. Well said. It was a great pleasure to have you as always. It's a treat. Ha ha happy Passover, happy Easter, and thanks to all. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. And I won't make my horrible pun that this is a good Friday, but there we go. <laughs> 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 I well, made it by you, accident Carrie. yesterday. I told everybody, I was like, oh, I won't see you tomorrow. Have a good Friday. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that was a good one. It was a good Friday. Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I uncontrollably pun and I don't mean it. And then I laugh at myself. So I self entertain <laughs> How many students did we have, uh, Carrie? Uh, I have to do the back end. So it, I can see 80, but oh, yeah. there's a lot of this, their classes, though. So we do a registration where we can tell one registration might actually be 20 kids or 30 kids. So I, I would say a couple hundred, um, okay. but um, very good. So thank you, Ryan. Nice to see you as well. That was fantastic. Um, really great and wonderful. And I, there were so many like kind of anchors, but it's, it made me smile when you talked about um, reason, argument, and evidence. It's like exactly how you're trained as an educator to teach kids to think, okay, give me your reasoning, give me your argument. Okay, let's get, cite the evidence. Like that's good historiography. And this is how we should be teaching the basics. And it, Vicky did ask a question in there about like, is it the lack of the civic education training that is causing this not to happen? And it made me just wonder where is it popping up and what causes well, it? Well, it is. I mean, do. the civic education, it's why the work you're doing is so important at the National Constitution Center. It's just not happening. You know, it's just, I mean, it should yeah. be in every school, right? It should be, your work should be, you should be doing the advanced stuff, but you've got to do basic um, because it's just not happening. No one yeah. else is doing it. And it's, little kids are hardwired for it. So it's not like they don't want it. They love it. They love this yeah. stuff. They're fantastic at civil dialogue and discussion. <laughs> um, it's wonderful. So thank you so much. I'm going to be sending you, you an email. I'll send you an email this next week about the Summer Teacher Institute. If you can do them, I'll send you a couple oh, okay. options. Because I know you. that they would love to dive deep into this. Got it. Thanks, cool. Gary. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one. Thank you, students. You guys have a great one, too. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Colin. Sorry, Colin, try to sneak it in. <laughs> Ran out of time.
No, but I'm going to look it up right now, Colin, because if I don't do it right now, it's going to take me a month and I'll just keep saying that. Um, it was, was it last Wednesday at 12? Do you remember which class? 